fear grips southern Gaza with Israeli bombardment. UK announces new measures to cut net migration. Good afternoon and salam alaykum. I'm Otto Othman for World Today. Israel's army on Monday sent dozens of tanks into southern Gaza as part of expanded action against Hamas, despite global concern over mounting civilian deaths as communications was cut across the besieged territory. Tanks, armored personnel carriers and bulldozers were seen near the southern Gaza city of Khan Yunis, which is packed with internally displaced Palestinians. Weeks after Israel deployed ground forces in the north of the Gaza Strip, the army has been airdropping leaflets in parts of the south, telling Palestinians to flee to other areas. Hoping to flee the bombardments, others continue to move further south, their belongings piled onto donkey carts, battered vehicles and even camels, but airstrikes have followed them right to the southern border. Gaza's Hamas-run health ministry says nearly 15,900 people have been killed in the territory, about 70 percent of them women and children. During Israel's relentless air, artillery and naval bombardments alongside its ground campaign. The toll has sparked a global alarm and mass demonstrations. The elder, a group of global leaders, accused Israel of disproportionate action and called on governments providing military assistance to Israel to rethink their approach. The group said in a statement, Israel's retaliation has reached a level of inhumanity towards Palestinians in Gaza that is intolerable. Meantime, the president of the Red Cross arrived at war-torn Gaza on Monday, describing the human suffering as immense and calling for a political solution to end the fighting in the Palestinian territory. I'm calling on all parties, on everyone who has an influence, to de-escalate and to find other, the military solutions to what is an immense suffering of the people on both sides. We have to protect the rights of the people. We have to protect the rights of the civilians. We have to protect the rights of the detainees. We have to protect the rights of the hostages. The ICSC will do its utmost to help alleviate and reduce the suffering, but we can't do this alone. And there's not only a humanitarian solution to this. There must be a political one. Spoiled outage travel to the region would be in several stages, with a visit to Israel expected over the coming weeks. During her visit to Gaza, Spoljavich also spent time with the organization's team on the ground and visited the European hospital where ICRC medical teams have been conducting life-saving surgery alongside local healthcare workers. Britain has unveiled a raft of measures aimed at cracking down on record levels of migration, a key battleground in the general election expected next year. The UK announced it would raise the minimum salary threshold for a skilled worker visa and prevent overseas health and social care staff from bringing family dependents to Britain. Including 85, this will reform the list of jobs where exceptions are made due to shortages and tougher rules on whether workers can bring their families. Migration to this country is far too high and needs to come down. And today, and today we are taking more robust action than any other government before in order to bring this down. In total, this package plus our reduction in student dependence, dependence will mean around 300,000 fewer people will come in future years than have come to the UK last year. High levels of legal migration have for more than a decade dominated Britain's political landscape and Sunak has promised to gain more control after lawmakers in his Conservative Party criticise his record ahead of an election due next year. The measures could lead to new disputes with business owners who have struggled to hire workers in recent years given Britain's persistently tight labour market and the end of free movement from the European Union following Britain's departure from the bloc. 
Guyana said it would remain vigilant after Venezuelans voted overwhelmingly in favor of claiming an oil-rich border region that makes up more than two-thirds of its territory. Earlier, Caracas said that more than half of eligible Venezuelan voters had taken part in the referendum that yielded a 95% yes outcome. Venezuela has for decades laid claim to Esquibo, which Guyana has administered for over 100 years, and is home to 125,000 of its 800,000 citizens. Litigation is pending before the International Court of Justice, ICJ, in The Hague over where the border should lie. Guyana, a former British and Dutch colony, insists the frontiers were determined by an arbitration panel in 1899. But Venezuela, which does not recognize the ICJ's jurisdiction in the matter, claims the Esquibo River to the region's east forms a natural border and had historically been recognized as such. The dispute has intensified since ExxonMobil discovered oil in Esquibo in 2015. Caracas called Sunday's referendum after Georgetown started auctioning off oil blocks in Esquibo in August. A former U.S. ambassador to Bolivia and a member of the National Security Council has been charged with spying for Cuba for 40 years. The Justice Department on Monday said the charges against Victor Manuel Roca, 73, exposes one of the highest-reaching and long-lasting infiltrations of the United States government by a foreign agent. Roca, a neutralized U.S. citizen originally from Colombia, allegedly began aiding Havana as a covert agent of Cuba's General Directorate of Intelligence in 1981, and his espionage activities continued to the present. Roca served on the National Security Council from 1994 to 1995 in the administration of Bill Clinton and was the ambassador to Bolivia from 2000 to 2002 under Clinton and George W. Bush. His government posts offered him access to non-public information, including classified information and the ability to affect U.S. foreign policy. The charges against him include conspiring to act as an agent of a foreign government, acting as an agent of a foreign government without prior government consent, and using a U.S. passport obtained by making false statements. Roca allegedly admitted his activities to an undercover FBI agent, posing as a Cuban operative. Timor-Leste hopes to become a full member of ASEAN when Malaysia chairs the Body Summit in 2025. The country has also applied to join the World Trade Organization, WTO, in 2016. The conclusion of WTO session negotiations is expected in February 2024. So, uh, we are very happy. Uh, as everyone knows, as Malaysia is going to be a chair of ASEAN. 2025. So hopefully, in that time, Timor Leste will become a full member of an ASEA, of ASEAN, and we will celebrate this membership, a full membership in Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur. He added that Malaysia had played an important role in Timor Leste's economic development and capacity building in various areas. He was met at the Friends of Timor-Leste Malaysia Business Networking and dinner event yesterday. At the same event, Timor La Rosa Group Private Limited inked a memorandum of understanding with the Hanimed Sendian Berhad to develop a tertiary hospital in Timor-Leste. Its chief executive officer, Mariam Shafi, said the tertiary hospital would start its construction in the middle of next year with a cost of 50 million U.S. dollars. Nigerian Army drone strike error kills civilians. Stay tuned. An Army drone strike accidentally hit a village in northwestern Nigeria, killing dozens of civilians celebrating a Muslim festival. The Army did not provide details or a death toll for the strike late Sunday in Tudunbiri village, Kaduna State, but residents said dozens were killed and wounded. 
Local officials also reported fatalities. Dozens of wounded were taken to a teaching hospital in the state capital, Kaduna. Local State Security Commissioner Samuel Aruan said following a meeting with army officials and community leaders. According to the army, it was a routine mission against militants that inadvertently affected members of the community. Nigerian military bombing raids have caused civilian casualties in the past. At least 20 fishermen were killed and several injured in a September 2021 attack in Kwatar Daban Masara on Lake Chad in the northeast, when the military mistook them for militants. Three survivors were found yesterday in Indonesia after the Marapi volcano erupted in West Sumatra as search operations which were halted temporarily over safety concerns resumed. Now, according to spokesperson for the search and rescue team, Jody Haryawan, the rescue team recovered 11 dead bodies out of 75 climbers who were in the area at the time of the Sunday's eruption. There were 49 climbers evacuated from the area early on Monday, and many were being treated for burns and there were still 12 climbers missing. The rescue team said it took around four to six hours to evacuate one dead body from the volcano, adding that it's very difficult as the rescue team said they feared further eruptions when they stopped their search. Authorities raised the alert to the second highest level and prohibited residents from going within three kilometers of the crater. Marapi is one of the most active volcanoes on Sumatra Island and its most deadly eruption was in April 1979 when 60 people were killed. Parts of Cumbria in the north of England were covered in snow and ice on the following severe snowfall that led to widespread power outages with approximately 200 vehicles stranded during the weekend. The challenging weather conditions which resulted in ice rink Monday as the snow refroze overnight prompted the closure of about a dozen schools in northeast of Scotland. A yellow warning for ice was put in place for Sunday through Monday. It was reported that Cumbria experienced unexpected heavy snowfall exceeding 30 centimeters in some areas following the convergence of opposing winds over the Irish Sea. The meteorology office said they expected rain and hail snow with icy conditions in places for Cumbria on Tuesday. Police and emergency services said the snow and ice caused major incidents. Mountain rescue teams were called in to help with numerous incidents, addressing issues ranging from potential cardiac arrests to spinal injuries caused by sledging accidents. Some visitors were stranded in Ambleside, Cumbria, after 20 centimeters of snow landed in just a few hours. UK's only giant pandas left Edinburgh for China after spending 12 cubless years in the Scottish capital. It was hoped that female Tian Tian and male Yang Guang would produce a cub during their stay in Edinburgh Zoo. But the bears never succeeded in conceiving. The pandas were transported to the airport in metal crates and loaded into a cargo plane with a pallet of bamboo ahead of their flight back to China. They will spend time in quarantine on arrival in China before being rehomed at a sanctuary in Chengdu, the capital of southwestern China's Sichuan province. The pandas arrived at Edinburgh Zoo in December 2011 as part of a 10-year agreement between the RZSS and the China Wildlife Conservation Association, which was later extended by two years. During their stay in Edinburgh, the popular pair even had a special tartan created in their honor in black, white, and gray representing their fur and red to symbolize China. The death toll from landslides and flooding triggered by heavy rainfall in northern Tanzania climbed to 68 as rescue workers searched for trapped survivors. Images broadcast on television show debris from houses including furniture strewn across streets with key roads, power lines and communication networks disrupted. At least 100 houses were swallowed by mud and a village with 28 families flattened. Tanzania's Prime Minister Kasim Majaliwa on Monday paid tribute to the victims during a ceremony in Katesh to hand over their remains to their families. 
He believes that more bodies will be recovered as operation continues, adding that 116 people were injured in the disaster. An American woman died after a shark attacked her while paddle boarding in the Bahamas. The woman, who was in her 40s and visiting from Boston, was with a male relative when the attack occurred near a resort in western New Province. Police said CPR was administered to the victim. However, she suffered serious injuries to the right side of her body, including the right hip region and also her right upper limb. Thousands of protesters gathered in New Zealand's city squares, motorway bridges and in front of the country's parliament today to protest the new government's policies that they believe are racist. The protest action was called for by political party Te Pati Māori and coincides with the opening of New Zealand's 54th parliament later in the day. A new centre-right government outlines plans to win back the use of Maori language, review affirmative action policies and assess how the country's founding treaty document is interpreted in legislation. Te Pati Māori co-leader Rawiri Waititi led hundreds of protesters in a march through Wellington City to the country's distinctive Beehive Parliament building, calling for demonstrators to make their voices heard. A struggling dairy farm in Yorkshire in the north of England has been overwhelmed with bookings after offering a cow-cuddling experience. The farm made the decision to diversify and expand to cow-cuddling and conservation after struggling to make a profit out of dairy farming. The farmers hope that the cuddling experience, which costs £50 per person for two hours, will help bring in enough income to make the farm financially sustainable. record a 6.7 billion pound TV deal that and more in our sports segment the national men's junior hockey squad or also known as the young Tigers must not be carried away with the Sunday's 1-0 win over India in a friendly match at the National Hockey Stadium in Bukit Jalil Sports analyst Dato Dr. Pekan Ramli said the Young Tigers must instill the spirit of winning when they open their campaign in the 2023 Junior World Cup or JWC against Chile at the National Hockey Stadium in Bukit Jalil today. Speaking to Bernama, Dato Dr. Pekan feels that if coach Muhammad Amin Rahim's charges can defeat Chile in their opening match, it will certainly serve as a draw card for hockey lovers in the country to fill the stands for their second match against Argentina. The presence and support of a strong crowd can serve as a tonic for the players who will be up against Argentina, currently the best team in the world and the defending champion. He also urged football fans who will be coming to watch the Malaysia Cup final at the National Stadium in Bukit Jalil on Friday to come early and watch the Malaysia versus Argentina match played earlier to provide moral support, since entrance is free. Malaysia's best ever finish in the tournament was a fourth place finish in three editions, namely the inaugural tournament in 1979 held in France, 1982 in Kuala Lumpur, and 2013 in India, while the Young Tigers failed to get past the quarter-final stage in the previous edition. Former world number one Rafael Nadal said he expects nothing from himself before his return to the courts next month. Nadal, 37, has been out with a hip injury since last January, but is set to feature at Brisbane in the near year. The Spaniard will use the tournament as a warm-up to the Australian Open in Melbourne, having slumped in 663rd in the world before starting his final year before his expected retirement. Tengo y he tenido miedo de anunciar las cosas eh, porque al final es un año sin competir y es una operación de cadera. Pero lo que más me preocupa no es la cadera, no, sino es todo lo demás. Creo que estoy preparado y, y confío y espero que, que las cosas vayan bien y que me dé la oportunidad de, de poder disfrutar en la pista atrás. Al final es mucho tiempo, con lo cual espero eh, lo primero pues eh, sentir otra vez esos nervios, eh, esa ilusión, esos miedos, eh, esas dudas 
y espero de mí, espero de mí no esperar nada. Esta es la verdad. No. Since being sidelined, Nadal has been overtaken in the number of Grand Slam tournaments won by Serbian world number one Novak Djokovic, who now has 24 major titles. Nadal will try to return to the highest level in Australia with the aim of competing at the French Open, which he has won a record 14 times. He is in line for a busy final season with the Grand Slams and the Olympic Games, where he won singles gold in Beijing in 2008 and doubles gold in Rio in 2016. The Premier League announced it had agreed a record £6.7 billion domestic television rights deal for a four-year period starting from 2025-26 season. Now, the current deal is reported to be worth around £5 billion over a three-year cycle and covers 200 matches per season. The English top flight hailed the agreements shared between different broadcasters as the largest sports media rights deals ever concluded in the UK. Sky Sports and TNT Sports have retained their rights to show live matches with BBC Sport will continue to broadcast highlights via its Match of the Day program. The Premier League boasted of a 4% increase in live rights value compared with the previous process, but the broadcasters will be paying significantly less per game because they will be showing more matches each season. The Premier League said the new deal would provide financial certainty for clubs throughout professional football until at least 2029. It is the first Premier League tender process since 2018 as the current deal was rolled over in 2021 for an extra three years due to the impact of the coronavirus pandemic. International rights for the English top flight overtook the value of domestic rights for the first time last year and are estimated to bring in £5.3 billion between 2022 and 2025. From Spain winning the Women's World Cup to a steady flow of big-name players signing for Saudi Arabian sides, here are some highlights of football stories of the year. Spain beat England 1-0 to win the Women's World Cup, which was held in Australia and New Zealand. Captain Olga Carmona scored the only goal of the game to seal a first triumph for Spain, who, along with their opponents, were appearing in the final for the first time. There was much controversy following Spain's victory. However, after the president of the Spanish Football Association, Luis Rubiales, kissed striker Jenny Hormoso on the lips at the presentation ceremony. After much arguing, FIFA banned Rubiales from the sport for three years, while national team coach Jorge Vilda also lost his job due to his ties with Rubiales. Manchester City beat Inter Milan 1-0 in the Champions League final in Istanbul to seal a historic treble, the club having already clinched a third successive English Premier League title and the FA Cup. Spaniard Pep Guardiola became the first manager to win a treble with two different clubs, having also done it with Barcelona in 2009. Bayern Munich snatched their 11th consecutive Bundesliga title in dramatic fashion with a final day, 2-1 win at Cologne courtesy of Jamal Musiala's 89th-minute goal, grabbing the trophy from the hands of rivals Borussia Dortmund. Bayern had parted ways with coach Julian Nagelsmann in late March, appointing Thomas Tuchel as his replacement. The team was bolstered in the summer by the signing of Harry Kane from Tottenham Hotspur. The England captain made a sensational start of his career in Germany, scoring 18 goals in his first 12 Bundesliga appearances. Nagelsmann went on to replace Hansi Flick as head coach of the national team in September after a poor run of form culminated in a 4-1 home loss to Japan in a friendly match. The summer transfer window saw a steady flow of big-name players signing for Saudi Arabian sides. Cristiano Ronaldo was the first to go at the turn of the year, and he was followed by a host of others including Neymar and Karim Benzema. While on the coaching side, Roberto Mancini left his post in charge of Italy's national team to take up a similar position for Saudi Arabia. 
One player who did not follow was Argentina's World Cup winning captain, Lionel Messi, who signed for Inter Miami in the MLS. In October, Messi won a record eighth Ballon d'Or, awarded for the best soccer player in the world. Now, there is no plan B for the opening ceremony of the Paris 2024 Olympic Summer Games, the French sports minister said, after a man armed with a knife and hammer killed a German tourist and left two people wounded near the Eiffel Tower on Saturday. The attack occurred on the Quinte de Grenelle, a spot also included in the plans for the opening ceremony. Asked if the government was mulling a change to its plan to hold the ceremony on the River Shine, the several hundred thousand spectators expected along its banks amid the security threats. The minister said it was not being worked on them by the government. Il y a aussi des dispositifs de sécurité qui vont être très rehaussés pendant les Jeux Olympiques et Paralympiques. Typiquement, l'endroit où s'est passé cet attentat horrible euh, correspond à un périmètre silt, mm -hmm. sécurité intérieure et loi terrorisme, dans lequel euh, on a la possibilité d'avoir des contrôles extrêmement poussés, des fouilles, des contrôles d'identité. Donc, ce sont des périmètres qui sont hautement sécurisés. Donc, on a sur la cérémonie d'ouverture incontestablement un défi sécuritaire tout particulier, extrêmement élevé. On le sait depuis le premier jour, c'est incorporé dans notre préparation. Some 160 boats will set off on July 26 from the Port de Austerlitz for a 6-kilometer journey to the Point Diena. In an event, Tony Estegert, the head of the organizing committee, described as unique and spectacular. American daredevil Brian Grubb has combined wake skating and base jumping to pull off a fearless stunt in Dubai. Now, the two-time wake skating world champion started on the sky bridge at the Address Beach Resort, scooting 94 meters across a rooftop infinity pool, 240, 294 meters above sea level. Grubb was towed across the water by a custom drone before bailing off his board and base jumping 77 stories onto the beach below. To build up experience for the stunt, Grubb worked with base jumping veteran Miles Dasher, completing a thorough four-camp training program in Switzerland and the United States, which included 112 jumps to help increase his confidence. The successful mix of wake skating and base jumping has been dubbed Wake Base. And with that, we reach the end of today's bulletin. In our top story today, fear grips southern Gaza amid Israeli bombardment. Do join us again tonight at 8.30 p.m. on TV1 and Saldoran Brita RTM for more news. Till then, I'm Otto Othman for the Rivers to the Sea. Palestine will be free. Goodbye.